Um, it's a pleasure to introduce the next uh, session of, of QIP. We have three talks in this session on rather varied topics. Um, and the first speaker is going to be uh, Chinmei, who's going to be telling us about circuit lower bounds for low energy states of code Hamiltonians. So um, thank you very much and please take it away whenever you're ready. Uh, uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, and thank you uh, for returning to this session. This is a joint work uh, with my fellow collaborator at Berkeley, Anurag Anshu. Uh, and let's just get started. So what we know is that the ground states of local Hamiltonians are provably highly entangled, non-classical, and capture notions of universal quantum computation. And yet, while we know that the ground states of local Hamiltonians possess very important properties that we are interested in studying in both the computer science and physics capacity, little is known of the regime of higher energy states. So what happens when we move past the ground space to higher energy states? What do we know of these states? Are they even quantum? Are they entangled? Are they non-classical? What can we say about these properties that we may be interested in for low energy states? So the best understanding of the complexity of low energy states was formulated in a conjecture that's almost a decade old now uh, called the NLTS conjecture by uh, Friedman and Hastings that states that there are, there are local Hamiltonians, which we can describe, for which every state of low energy is highly entangled and non-classical. And in due course, I will make all these statements precise as to what I mean by low energy or highly entangled or non-classical. But just thinking about what this kind of conjecture implies, it implies that these local Hamiltonians have no classical approximation for ground states. So these are the state, these are kind of the Hamiltonians which we can really think of as truly quantum. Understanding the ground state energy, even to a nice precision, cannot be done with any classical approximation. And these states also are the ones that if you were brought to room temperature, if you so if you add energy to the system, the, the states, even at low temperature, still remain highly entangled, a property which we are not necessarily certain is true. Our work today is going to prove a circuit depth lower bound as a method for proving precisely that the states are highly entangled and non-classical. And we're going to prove this circuit depth lower bound for every low energy state of local Hamiltonians that arise from error correcting codes, quantum error correcting codes. So formally, our results require the following definition. So let's take C as an NKD stabilizer error correcting code of constant locality. So it's a double sided LDPC code, where N being the number of physical qubits, K the logical qubits, and D the erasure distance. And if we take the corresponding local Hamiltonian, which is just defined uh, term-wise, one term given for every term, uh, every check term of the original code, then we'll find that for any mixed state of energy less than epsilon n, so that's what trace of h rho means, is that's the measurement of the energy of rho with respect to h, that the circuit depth of rho can be lower bounded. In particular, the lower bound depends on two components, one is a minimum of the log of the distance of the code. Uh, so if we think of the code as having polynomial distance, say square root n or something like this, then that's just log n as well. And interestingly enough, we're able to prove a bound based on the log of the ratio of the logical rate to number of physical qubits times a small factor depending upon uh, epsilon. So epsilon here, again, being the energy uh, of the state row. So let's, uh, let's be a little more concrete as to what that implies for specific families of codes which we're familiar with. So if we think of a code where the rate is linear and the distance is polynomial, then for a state of energy on the order of n to the point 99 or smaller, we are conclusively able to prove a circuit depth lower bound of log, log n. And generalizing that to any state of energy little all of n, we're able to prove a circuit lower bound of super constant. So prior to this work, we had actually only known a super constant lower bound for all states of energy 
little o of n to the negative two, much, much smaller than the n to the point 99 that we were able to do, where the conjectured heart best result one could hope for is order n. And this result is, only, is known just from the QMA hardness of the local Hamiltonian problem. There had been prior bounds on the order of log n established for restricted subclasses of low energy states, whether that be epsilon error states by Eldar Harrow or myself, uh, Mazarani and UN, or one-sided error as uh, uh, suggested in the first paper by Friedman and Hastings, Gibbs states by Eldar, or Z2 symmetry by Bravi et al. But until this result, uh, the notion for all energy states was only known for order n to the negative two or uh, smaller. So what sort of codes can we prove a lower bound for of an interesting variety? So one example is the Telix z more hypergraph product codes. Those are codes which we already know to have linear rate and polynomial distance. So for those, we're able to prove a circuit lower bound of order log n as well. But another interesting family that might not be as obvious is the puncture torque code with n to the one minus delta holes. So that is a code with the rate that's on the order of n to the one minus delta, and its distance is only n to the delta. But for a state of energy less than n to the one minus two delta, the circuit complexity is already order delta log n. So if we think of delta as some constant like 1%, that's still an interesting lower bound on the circuit complexity. This actually is a rather surprising result because we're able to show that the circuit complexity of the state is quite high, even when the distance of the code is very small. So even well past, if we raise the temperature of the puncture toric code, well past the erasure distance, we're still able to maintain entanglement while all information may suddenly be lost. Interesting property. And secondly, our lower bound shows that a will show that a depth uh, constant circuit cannot approximate the ground state energy to accuracy better than order n, uh, even if the Hamiltonian is commuting, such as the example of the puncture torque code. And this seems to serve as a limitation that quantum on quantum circuit ansatz is like VQE. So that, that might be of independent interest to the uh, algorithmic community as well. Uh, lastly, let's just talk about what how this fits in the biggest bigger picture of the NLTS conjecture by Friedman and Hastings or the quantum PCP conjecture. So that conjecture was trying to formalize whether there exists a positive epsilon and a family of local Hamiltonians with every state of energy less than epsilon n having a super constant circuit lower bound. Our result instead is gonna prove a small weakening of that result, but where our theorem proves the lower bound of uh, order log one over epsilon instead of a super constant circuit lower bound. So there's a small dependence on epsilon instead of being independent of the factor. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, remember that NLTS, the no low trivial states conjecture is a necessary consequence of the quantum PCP conjecture, which questions whether the local Hamiltonian problem has a hardness of amplification result as well. And furthermore, the NLTS is also makes progress as to whether we can conduct quantum computations at room temperature, because NLTS in many ways is asking whether entanglement or complex quantum systems are still present when we uh, lift a Hamiltonian system to a higher temperature. Okay. So how are we gonna prove a lower bound for low energy states? What does that even kind of look like? So before we start, maybe we should ask ourselves, what do low energy states look like? So for one, we're, we know that they contain all states of distance less than epsilon from the code. So this is any state psi whose, for which there exists a state rho in the code, such that the L2 distance or L1 distance uh, of psi and rho is at most epsilon. Why is this the case? Well, for if you take a state that's in this uh, ball and we try to compute its energy, we notice that we can, first of all, take the energy uh, and uh, consider it component by component of the Hamiltonian. And in each component, we notice that the trace of HI psi is only off by the trace of HI rho by at most epsilon, just because of the fact that uh, these are all linear 
operations and that the state sign rho are off by a distance of epsilon. And since rho is a code state, trace of hi rho is going to be zero. It has no energy with respect to the code Hamiltonian as it's a code state. So the total energy of the state is at most epsilon n. And when Anurag and I were first trying to prove our result, we started off by trying to look at just this simpler problem, the subproblem of low distance states. And what we found was that there isn't actually a well-known lower bound for even low distance states. And as I'll show you soon, the lower bound that we're able to prove for low distance states is actually captures almost all, almost all the big intuition necessary to push it to low energy states, our argument. Okay. Let's break down kind of the necessary definitions and lemmas one that we'll need. So we're going to define circuit complexity of a state rho as the minimum depths of any circuit that exactly produces the state rho. So you take a circuit U of depth T that you know whose output on some fraction of the qubits is going to be rho, and the other fraction of qubits we're allowed to trace out if we need to. So this allows us to generalize our uh, definition to mixed states. Some simple properties we recognize is that a state has circuit complexity less than one if and only if it is a tensor product state. And secondly, given a constant locality Hamiltonian and a state of circuit complexity T, we know there's of a classical algorithm for computing the energy of rho with respect to H in time that's polynomial in N and doubly exponential in T. So to this sense, it, this gives us a very nice picture and understanding of what circuit complexity means in terms of entanglement. When the circuit complexity is low, near zero, the state looks very classical. And as the circuit complexity increases, it becomes more and more entangled. And this entanglement is sort of different than maybe some other notions of entanglement we've seen in other results in the quantum PCP literature, which can be entanglement between just two parties. This is a notion of multipartite entanglement, a sort of complex entanglement that persists across the whole system. Uh, we'll also need a technical definition uh, of a light cone. So the light cone idea is pretty simple as shown in this cartoon. We're gonna let I be some qubit. So in this case, it's the second from the right at the bottom. And the light cone Li is just going to be all the qubits that are information connected to I. So if we think of the light cone is a propagation of uh, information. The qubits at the top uh, marked as Li are the only ones whose, which can depend on the input that is at qubit I. And if we assume without loss of generality uh, that our circuit is you know, too local, then a simple fact says that the size of the light cone is at most exponential in T, uh, where T again will be the depth of the circuit. Another very useful fact we're going to need is that if I want to know the value of the ith qubit of the state rho, or the ith qubit of the state rho when rotated by a unitary u, it suffices for me to consider just the ith qubit of the reduced light, uh, the reduced density matrix on the light cone. So that's exactly what's written in fact two, is I can simplify, instead of take, thinking about just rho, I can think about just the reduced density matrix just on that light cone. And this fact can be proven just through some standard uh, linear algebra results. Uh, and I, I'll be using the trace negative i notation as a way of tracing out all the qubits but i from now into the future of the talk. The last ingredient I'm going to need is just to remind you of a property of error correcting codes called local indistinguishability. So we know that an error correcting code has distance d if for every code state rho and s being a set of qubits of size less than d, so a correctable region of qubits, that the state rho can be recovered from rho minus s. So if I just trace out those that, that correctable region, I can still recover the state. A wonderful consequence of this erasure property is that the state that we did trace out, the part that we removed, rho s, must be an invariant over the code states rho. So meaning that, that the density matrix that describes rho s is a fixed density matrix no matter which code state rho I started with. 
And the proof, uh, you can prove it through uh, breaking down Canillo farm conditions, but there's a very intuitive idea, which is we are able to correct the remainder of the state back into rho, right? If from rho negative s, I can get back to rho s. So even if rho s even partially depended on the original state, then this is a violation of no cloning, since I'm able to make it even a partial clone of the state uh, if it wasn't an invariant. So we know that rho s is a complete invariant over code states. So we're going to use this crucial property of invariance, as well as this fact two of light cones very heavily in our argument. So I, uh, I can just go over them once again, that we know that, so fact two being that the reduced density matrix of rotated rho only depends on the reduced density matrix of rho on Li, the light cone. And secondly, that the reduced density matrix on a recover on a correctable region is an invariant over the code state. Okay, let's get into a small proof sketch. So as I said earlier, proving a circuit lower bound for all low energy states seems like a very daunting task. Let's consider the simplified problem of proving a circuit lower bound just for low distance states. So what do I formally mean again by low distance? I mean, any state psi whose distance from the error correcting code is delta in L1. And we want to know what the circuit complexity is. So a well-known folklore result based on light cone arguments is that for any code state row, the circuit complexity is order log D and an upper bound is known due to a result of Gottesman and Aronson. And so uh, for simplicity uh, of this talk, we're only going to consider uh, psi being pure and circuits without ancillas, although our results do hold, of course, for uh, mixed states and circuits with ancillas, but I'll leave that to reading the paper if you want that exact argument. So what we're going to be able to show is something kind of amazing is let uh, root delta be less than k over n. So if this is a linear rate code, k over n is a constant. So for some constant bound on delta, we're going to find that for any state psi of distance delta from the code, the circuit complexity of psi is at least log d. So what that formula means is this lower bound that we were able to state for the code space in, in green over there actually extends to a little ball around the code, an L1 ball. And the radius of that ball we can prove is uh, this delta, such that root delta is less than k over n. Okay, so how do we go about proving this? So here's the first step. So let's define some states. Let's define rho as the closest code state to psi. So it's just the point that's physically closest. And theta is going to be the encoded maxly mixed state. So that's just like if I encoded random coin flips in the using the quantum error correction code, that's going to that's a state that's still in the code space. It's a mixed state. It's a but it's still a well-defined code state. It sits somewhere in the code. And now we're going to let R be any region that's correctable. So the size of R is less than the than D, where D again is the distance of the code. And what do we have? First of all, we have that the reduced density matrix of psi must be delta close to the reduced density matrix of rho. This is just because the two states are physically close. So if they're physically close, tracing out some of the qubits can only make the distance closer. And secondly, we're going to invoke our local indistinguishability property to say that rho on R is exactly equal to theta on R. That's because R is a correctable region. So local indistinguishability says that the density matrices on the correctable region must be identical. Step two is we're gonna to need to make an assumption. We're gonna make an assumption for the purposes of contradiction that psi has a low depth circuit U of depth T such that two to the T is less than D. So that's where we're gonna find our contradiction is we're gonna find that something goes wrong, so two to the t cannot be less than d, and that exactly is gonna be our circuit lower bound at the end. So what's written in orange is what we're gonna find a contradiction with. So what that means though, is if I take psi and I undo it by u dagger, right? So I undo the computation on psi by applying u dagger, every qubit of that state just must be zero. That's just undoing the first line of step two. Okay, step three is, well, this is just copying step two. 
And now we've used our first interesting ar argument. We first apply the like comb. So we know that we're looking at just the ith qubit of u dagger of rotated psi, but that's the same thing as thinking of the ith qubit of rotated u psi restricted to the like cone. That was uh, the like cone argument. And then the next step is just using step one, where we know that psi on a, uh, on a small light cone must be close to theta on a light cone. And now we've crucially done something kind of nice and tricky here is that by assuming that the depth two to the T is less than D, we've not only, uh, what we've shown is that the size of the light cone is less than D. Because remember the size of the light cone is at most two to the T. So that's why we can invoke step one because the light cone is now necessarily a correctable region. Okay, and now we're gonna do the same thing again of applying the light cone argument, just to go back from theta all the way to theta. So if we look at all of equation three together, let's just look at the outsides of the equation. What we're gonna get is that the ith qubit of rotated theta looks very much like zero, zero. So it's very close, it's delta close to zero, zero. So for one thing, that tells me that the entropy of that ith qubit of rotated theta is at most root delta. So now what do we have to do? Well, let's notice something that theta we thought of as this encoded maximally mixed state, right? It was the state of high entropy, which we know exists in this code. And that just comes from encoding uniform randomness. So its entropy is K, but that entropy is also equal to the entropy of rotated theta. If I rotate a state by a unitary, we know the entropy doesn't change. And a naive upper bound for the entropy of a state is the sum of the entropy qubit by qubit, which is exactly what's written here. But we know that the on this side, that this is going to equal root delta n, or is upper bounded by root delta n because of step four. So putting it all together, what do we get? We get k is less than root delta n. But as you can see in the top left of this slide, that is precisely uh, contradicts our assumption. So we know something is wrong. So what must be wrong is our assumption that two to the t is less than d, proving our circuit lower bound. So let's just kind of recap kind of what's going on in this argument. So the idea being that we're going to say that if the rate of the code is high, if k is order n, we are unable to pack such a big uh, subspace so close to any state of low circuit complexity. And if there was a state of low circuit complexity near that region, the reduced density matrices of that low complexity state dominate and necessarily define the reduced density matrices of the code space. And as a consequence, we're able to find a contradiction out to the rate. Okay. So that was just the argument for low distance states. But what we know is that it's a the world of low energy states is vast and interesting. So if we think of the set of low energy states as this black circle, inside of course is the code states, those guys have energy zero. And then we have these epsilon distance states, low distance, but there can be generalized to a notion called epsilon smooth states. And also there's sort of a tangential picture that's been also studied of low error state. This was studied by Eldar Harrow and myself, Vazrani and Yuen, um, that are states where you, instead of uh, changing some of the Hamiltonian terms, you sort of work with the code states itself and corrupt some of the qubits. Uh, and this whole picture, this Venn diagram, is sort of the space of low energy states. And, what, and we know that this is much more complex than what goes on in the classical case of what looks like low error states, what looks like errors and low energy. And it's a sort of a diverse picture. So what we were able to show was just an argument for the low distance states, a smaller ball within the bigger picture. So how do we extend this argument? So we're going to need to use to assume some more machinery. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that not only is my state just in standard error correcting code, as uh, was true for the previous argument, but we're going to assume it's of a specialized variety. We're going to assume it's an LDPC stabilizer code where all the checks are tensor products of a few palities. A consequence of this assumption is that not only can I define a code space as the zero energy, as the ground space of the Hamiltonian, but 
I can also define all these nice different eigenspaces since the LWPC stabilizer code is a commuting Hamiltonian. And what's remarkable is that the local indistinguishability property I stated for the ground space of an error correcting code actually in the case of LDPC stabilizers holds for each eigenspace also. So it says if you have a correctable region R, then rho R is gonna be an invariant over each eigenspace. And this rho R can depend on S, but it's an invariant over each eigenspace. So then what do we do? The idea is we take a state of low energy and we have to first measure psi with the stabilizer code checks, and this will collapse it into a mixture of these eigenstates. And then what we do is we apply an argument similar to the low distance argument, but we do it eigenstate, eigenspace by eigenspace. And then we have to kind of, so we apply this argument eigenspace by eigenspace, and then we kind of collapse it all back together. And similar to what we did in the low distance argument, we're gonna argue that this is gonna put a bound on the rate of the code based on the circuit depth of phi. And together we can use this to get the lower bound uh, that we uh, stated in the beginning of uh, um, for any low energy state. So uh, as I'm running out of time, let's just uh, return to some open questions that are still remaining. So our lower bound holds for any state of energy little o of n. But there are weaker notions of uh, circuit complexity lower bounds, such as the combinatorial NLTS conjecture, which we're not sure if they're true even uh, for epsilon equals order one. This might be an independent question for us to explore. I think a very interesting question that's now worth pursuing is, do we know if the local Hamiltonian problem for promise gap n to the negative very small number is also QMA hard? So previously, we've only known that the local Hamiltonian problem with promise gap n to the negative two is QMA hard. Uh, the or almost NLTS theorem I stated is the corresponding consequence to the local Hamiltonian problem with promise gap n to the negative 0 0.01 also being QMA hard. And lastly, we know some circuit lower bounds for other notions of ground space approximations, such as NLETS, and these seem non-reproducible using R uh, construction of a high rate code argument. So can our techniques reproduce these other results for a known circuit lower bounds? And uh, thank you with that. I'll conclude and uh, answer any questions you may have. Brilliant. So thanks very much for that very nice talk. Um, so there have already been some questions on Slack, which uh, I'm going to uh, to go through and um, please do carry on asking questions on there. We still have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, okay, so one question uh, which was asked by Dina Abdelhadi. Um, I can see that there was already a, an answer from your co-author on Slack, but uh, let's, uh, let's uh, see your perspective too. So Dina asks, aside from checking the conjecture, in what other areas are Hamiltonians constructed from error correcting codes interesting? Well, Hamiltonians constructed from error correcting codes by necessity are going to be the way we expand computation from the noisy regime that we currently talk about to uh, a fully fault tolerant, full fledged quantum computer. So understanding what states that are uh, embedded in such a Hamiltonian look like and how they behave at low energies may be fundamentally interesting to our understanding of how computation works as a function of temperature. Thank you. Um, and Dino also asks, uh, can your result be generalized uh, to consider Hamiltonians which are not necessarily generated from a code? Uh, at the moment, not that we know of. Uh, as you notice, some, some very specific properties were needed to be used, such as local indistinguishability and being high rate. Local indistinguishability is a very, uh, what's a good word, synthetic, a synthetic property of Hamiltonians not something we kind of expect for natural Hamiltonians. So proving these circuit lower bounds um, very much required notions of error correction. And in some sense, this isn't that surprising because uh, the sort of properties we're asking for from a Hamiltonian of being entangled at room temperature is sort of unnatural. We don't really expect entanglement to be something there. So this shouldn't be something you see if you're 
run of the mill garden variety Hamiltonian. This has to be something uh, more engineered. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess to, to try to keep to time, I'll just uh, do one more question, which is by Brendan Pankovich. And he asks, how sensitive is the circuit complexity if we relax the requirement of exact preparation of rho? For example, if we only need fidelity one minus delta. Okay, uh, great question. Um, so the nice thing is that we prove circuit complexity for every state of energy less than epsilon n, right? So if you were to relax this notion, what you're really asking is, what is the circuit complexity of a state nearby? So uh, this is completely captured in our definition because our, our major goal is to provide a circuit complexity lower bound for all low energy states. So if you were to relax the definition, nothing would really change. Maybe epsilon would become epsilon over two or two epsilon. I don't remember which way it goes. But. Fantastic. Um, so if you have any further questions, then uh, either you know you could you could ask on Slack or there will be the round table afterwards. And I hope uh, the speaker and all the speakers of the session will uh, be around for that. Um, but uh, if not, let's uh, thank uh, Chin, Chin Mei again for a wonderful talk. Um, and let's move on to the next speaker. Um, so uh, Tom, maybe you could start